Welcome to The Strategic Investor. Join us as we interview some of the world's most productive asset managers and uncover sophisticated and unique investment strategies in the markets. Here is your host, Charlie Wright. Hello and welcome to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio, where we bring you investment strategies you are not hearing elsewhere. That's especially the case today. But before we introduce our guest today, we'd like to make a special tribute. Today is the burial day of President, ex-President uh, George H.W. Bush. And we would just like to uh, let everyone know how proud and grateful we are to have had George H.W. Bush as a president, as vice president and president. His unselfishness, his integrity were always unquestioned. Anyone may disagree with any of his policies, and I never agreed with all of his policies. But when it came to integrity, honesty, unselfishness, he was at the top of the list. I've read a couple of books that have talked about him. One was his biography written by his son, George W., and uh, it just shows throughout. He was a hero in many ways, and he always acted on for the best interest of other people, etc. The second one was... Uh, a book by a former Secret Service agent who had provided service to various presidents, vice presidents, etc. And he told about them, uh, what they are like uh, uh, off camera. And uh, some of the experiences were direct, some were vicarious. And George H.W. Bush was at the top of the list, always, wherever he was, acting with integrity and honesty. So uh, we would like to uh, thank the Bush family for raising such a fine, fine person and for uh, being president of the United States and acting with such integrity. And it does make one wonder that if Ross Perot had not run for president in 1992, how very different history could have been. So we appreciate that opportunity to pass that along. And we'd now like to uh, introduce our guest for the day, Bernard Sorofsky, founder and chief investment officer of Measured Risk Portfolios. They are an investment management firm working with investment advisors, offering unique investment strategies headquartered in San Diego. And he is with us here in our studios in Orange County. Bernard, welcome to Strategic Investor Radio. Thank you, Charlie. So, Bernard, uh, you come out of the University of Cape Town in S- South Africa. You emigrated to the U.S. 1992. You formed Measured Risk Portfolios in 2007. And you used some very interesting and non-mainstream strategies. So let's start with a little background of yours. Well, again, as you mentioned, I'm you know, born in South Africa. I like to say I live in America by choice. I know what a great country this is. And I share your sentiments with respect to President Bush and uh, our condolences to the family. Thank you. Um, you know, in addition to that, you know, having come from a different world outlook, I've always looked at investing from the standpoint of how can we do this better and maybe different as well. And our strategies, as we'll, we'll uncover during the course of this interview, are exactly that. We don't have a conventional way of approaching the world. You know, our key point is to focus on the downside risk in the portfolio and take steps to mitigate that to a level where you're comfortable, either as the investor or as the investment advisor. So let's start with um, the 90-10 strategy. I've seen you give a little presentation where you hold up, uh, what is it you hold up, and only 10% is a different color, and you say that's the portion that we focus on. Correct, Charlie. We have a great visual aid to help explain what we do. Essentially, it's a green bar that represents 90% of the portfolio. And then there's a little red piece of uh, wood, for lack of a better term, that represents 10%, what we call the risk capital. And what we do is our focus is to take the 10% and we're prepared to lose 100% of that 10%. On the 90% portion, the green, we're we're not prepared to take any losses on that portion over a one-year time period. Um, So the idea there is we take the green money, represents what we call very safe money. So it'll be short maturity government bonds, or it might be in uh, ETFs that represent very short maturities on the bond side or mutual funds. And we'll blend those together to try and get a yield on that. We're not, we're certainly not aiming for the, you know, aiming for the home runs on that. 
We just don't want to have losses on that. Or if there could be, it's got to be a very, very small loss opportunity. So let me stop you for just a minute. So in today's world, for the past several years, the the the, the ninety percent that you're using for protection. I mean, short duration maturity fixed income products. They don't pay anything. Yeah, very little. They were paying very, very little, and uh, we were not looking for very much. Or we we just didn't want to lose anything in that pool. Because we don't. So, need if it's under half a percent, that's okay with you. Well, you know, it's okay. It's not, it's not. It's not wonderful. We don't love that, but it's we're at peace with it, uh, which is very important to understand. Because all of the risk we're taking is on that ten percent, and it becomes mathematical. If ten percent of your portfolio loses one hundred percent of its value, you will be down ten percent. Now, if ninety percent of your portfolio loses nothing, and ten percent loses a hundred, you're still down ten percent. On the other hand, if if 90% of your portfolio makes 2% and 10% of your portfolio loses 100, you'll be up, you know, you'll be down, but something just under 10%. Now, our feeling is that the 10% number is a reasonable starting point, especially if you want to have exposure to equities. And so the way we do that is we take that 10% and we'll buy call options on the S&P 500, and that's where we'll get our return. because. Uh- are these out of the money? Are they deep in the money? What, uh, what kind of call-offs? Generally speaking, it's, a, it's an issue of pricing. We'll, we'll either buy something that's slightly in the money or at the money, but we, know, you know, we could also go just a little bit out of the money, but that's the portion where we actively manage the risk. Um, so we'll have a combination of call options in there, some of which will be longer dated, some of which will be shorter dated. But again, we're, we're targeting to not lose more than 10% over a one-year period in that portion of the portfolio. And in, on the other 90%, we don't want to have losses there of anything meaningful at all. And, and that's very interesting. How, how do your clients react to that? So that's a great question because, you know, some people don't necessarily understand every op, you know, everything we're doing in, in the greatest detail. So because of the transparency of what we do, when questions arise, we can direct them to the website and actually show them the proverbial green section and also show them the proverbial red stuff, as I like to refer to it. And it's a wonderful sense of achievement when you can put people at peace, when they can see the green stuff, and you can tell them, look, the loss parameters in that are very, very small, and here's why. And we can show them the red stuff and explain to them why the loss parameters in that are 100%, but that's it. We can and we will lose 100% of that red stuff from time to time. So so in a market, in 2013, the market was up 33%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 2017, I don't recall exactly what it was up, but uh, 17 percent or 16 something, you know. Yeah. So in in markets where the our strategy works really well when there's big movements in the market. Um, so in a year like 2013, we were up very very nicely. We've had ve- some very nice years using this particular strategy. Now the market that's not wonderful for us is a flat market, because we are buying those call options and some of them will expire worthless. So if the market's pretty flat, we're going to tend to underperform by maybe you know 5 or 6%. My feeling on that is we still can't lose more than 10%. And we know that the S&P 500, generally speaking, goes up more than 10% when it goes up. But when it goes down, it can go down 20 or 30%. And that can be quite ruinous to a portfolio. It can go down 50%. As we have experienced. As we've experienced yeah. twice in this decade. Exactly. And so you know when that happens, you know, we were very, very pleased – you know, you mentioned we started in 2007, and as you may recall, 2008 was a somewhat, you know, <laughs> let me just call it a baptism by fire, <laughs> right. for lack of a better term. And in 2008, we were down 8.5%. Now, that is phenomenal. The market was down, you know, close to 40%, and we're down just under 8 Again, in that environment, the fixed money was earning, believe it or not, 5 5.5% back then on government bonds. So that helped offset the losses. And in 2009, we were up, you know, well over 25 percent when the market had a very good recovery. So our our clients were back to break even within six months. Now, that's giving people a commodity you simply cannot buy, which is time. So most people who were invested in the S&P 500 had to wait, you know, seven or eight years to get back to break even. Yeah, 2015. Yeah. So what happened was we were able to get back to not only break even, but being ahead of the curve within six or seven months of taking our losses because – the math is, you know, if you lose 10% in your portfolio, you only have to go up 11% to get back to break even. However, if you lose 50% in your portfolio, you need to go up 100% to get back to break even. And people don't actually understand that. I mean, I've spoken to 
some very educated people and I ask them about these numbers and they really have to stop and think about it, which, you know, you know it, may, it may surprise one, but that's what happens. People aren't thinking about the, the impact of losses as much as the greed of the gain. But, you know, as Warren Buffett said, you've got to try and protect that downside. You know, don't, you know rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, see, you know, see rule number one. Right. So, you know, our view is if we can keep the losses to manageable amounts, the recoveries will take care of themselves. We don't have to try and be overly aggressive to capture the upside. We will capture it when it arrives. If it doesn't arrive, we're not going to capture it. We're not trying to make money when there's no money to be made. So, Bernard, uh, you work primarily with advisors. Okay. That is correct, yes. So what, uh, what's the typical reaction of advisors, and what's their, what are their major objections that you typically have to overcome? Well, you know, we do manage this as a separately managed account, so sometimes that's a little bit more cumbersome in terms of just the setup. Um, we custody our assets at uh, TD Ameritrade. We have relationships with, another, with, a, with a number of other platforms as well. So it's, I think the biggest obstacle is probably just the SMA structure that we have, which is that separately managed account. Um, and then we, we do trade in the option portion from time to time. So that does generate uh, you know, activity reports to the clients. So, th- so those are the things that people need to just understand. And we're doing the trading in the option portion because that is where the risk is. And we actively manage that portion of the portfolio diligently and very, very consciously. So in this strategy, you have seen things that most advisors and certainly most retail investors have not seen. What is it that you think that you understand that you wish that they understood? Well, the thing that, you know, I kind of like to use the analogy that in this particular strategy, it's kind of like an airplane coming in to land or taking off. You know, We might have a slower ramp up in terms of getting the performance when things are moving up because we have this component called time value in an option that has to be overcome in order for that to filter its way through to the performance. And we do do certain things to try and offset some of that, but it's not going to always be successful. So it's just understanding that this is really a, it's a long-term view. If you're going to take a six-month view with our strategy – and the market happens to be flat or, or not really ideal to our, to our strategy, the performance is going to lag. Um, so I just wish, you know, people need to just be patient. This is a definitely a long-term strategy where we're gonna, we will give you lower volatility, we'll give you peace of mind, and that peace of mind, I can't overemphasize that. Uh, you know, I remember back in, I believe it was October of 2011, I believe it was that time period, we had the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling, the election coming up. I mean, it was a very, very uneasy time in, in the United States. And a client of mine calls up, a very nervous client at this time, and they want to take all their money out of the market. And it, it was a fairly sizable amount of money. It was, you know, less than a million, but more than half a million dollars. And so I'm on the phone with the client, and they are telling me how concerned they are about all of these external factors, and, and with good reason. I mean, these are clearly very, very solid reasons to be freaked out. Yeah, they weren't alone in being concerned. That is correct. And, you know, if you're watching any of the news reports at the time, talking about a debt ceiling and a fiscal cliff, I mean, these... And Greece. And, you know, Greece. I mean, there was just any number of things and an election that, you know, wasn't a certainty. And, oh, my goodness, there were just any number of news items. And so I guided the client to the website, and I went... You know, I went through each component piece with them, and the risk portion at that at that time, I believe the account was worth about seven hundred and fifty thousand. The risk portion at that po- at that time was about sixteen thousand dollars. So after I've shown the client the the account and I've gone through each piece, you know, in, in some in some detail, and I've explained to them, you know, if things continue the way they are or get worse, you will lose the sixteen thousand. But everything else in there, I just didn't see very much downside opportunity, barring the collapse of, you know, <laughs> the country, in which case money is your least of your problems. There was, a, there was this very odd silence at the other end of the phone. And, and I was, uh, you know, I go to the client and say, you know, you have about 16,000 more that can be lost in this portfolio. Silence. And I'm wondering, hmm. To which the reply came, Bernard, I had no idea you were taking such good care of us. I'm sorry for bothering you. I won't bother you again. To which I was dumbfounded, which in and of itself is quite an achievement. And uh, I was like, no, no, you're more than welcome to call me, you know, and ask me questions. She goes, you know, the client goes, I, I just didn't realize you're taking such good care of us. So it, it really struck me at that moment that we can, you know, giving people that peace of mind. Because clearly in the client's mind, they could lose $750,000, 
which was you know, a meaningful portion of their net worth, and nobody wants to experience that, especially after what happened in 2008 where people saw their accounts getting cut in half. And needless to say, as is you know, human nature, they then bailed out, watched the market recover over some period of time, got back in, only to get in right before that October 11 swoon, and then they get out again. So it's just it's a horror show. We give people the peace of mind to stay invested. Needless to say, the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling, and the election all got resolved. The markets recovered very nicely. The clients were up over, that, uh, over the time period that followed. It was really a very heartwarming experience for me and one that I, I think of a lot in terms of when people are getting nervous and I can take them to the website and show them, this is how much you have left to burn. You know, if you're not prepared to lose 16000 on 750000 at that point, now I have to emphasize it was at that point, um, you know, we had already suffered losses. So it wasn't that there was 16000 left, you know, th- there had been losses taken on that red portion already. Um, but because we stayed with, you know, we stayed invested when the recovery came. And again, you don't see it coming. You know, nobody rings a bell when the market makes a high, but nobody, that, nobody rings a bell when it makes a low either. That's for sure. Okay, so, so Bernard, uh, that's this strategy. You have two others. We don't want to get into the, the deep uh, weeds on, on uh, the other two, but just uh, very briefly describe the other two. Will you, are they completely different? Oh, yes. Well, the one's somewhat similar, but we're using a different instrument to get the performance. I'll get, I'll get into that one last, actually. I think the next one I'll get into, just to highlight for you the way we approach things differently at measured risk portfolios, we, we have a portfolio that's designed for more of an income-generating portfolio. And this particular portfolio, we call it the CLIP portfolio, consumer-linked income portfolio. And the thinking behind this is that people's lives are not determined so much by their net worth as by their income. So here we're looking – our income portfolio is about 98% invested in equities, and our growth portfolio is invested about 90% in bonds. So that's definitely not conventional wisdom. But on the consumer-linked income portfolio, the basic premise is that people have to do three things in order to stay alive. We have to eat. The natural process of eating is we have to use the restroom. And in order to sustain the species, we have to engage in the act of procreation. So in order to do that, we then go look at… Not necessarily in that order here. Right, correct, correct. Well, you do have to eat. (laughs) I think that comes before either of the other two. Okay. And so in order to… you know, in order to… Build a portfolio, we then look for companies that service those three very basic human needs. And I'll give you some examples of how we do that. You know, you have to eat, so go look for a food company. Now, we're not just looking for a food company, but we're looking for food companies that have a history of paying dividends and ideally have a history of increasing those dividends. The classic line is, if you can't beat them… Join them. Right, that's the classic line. However, our view is, if you can't beat them… Own them. Buy them, okay. So if you, if you own the companies that set the inflation rate or help you know, determine the inflation rate, you're not going to have a problem with having increasing income as, over, as time goes by. And the companies that sell those products, we want to own those companies. Again, if you can't beat them, own them. So we look for food companies, ideally, that have a history of increasing their dividends. If they haven't increased the dividends, I want to understand why. Perhaps they've made a big acquisition. They're going to be paying down debt. Well, that's, all, that's great. I love that because, you know, again, it's up to the management to just adequately manage the cash flow to, in due course, increase the dividend. Then we also look for companies that, you know, in terms of servicing the need for us to proverbially lay together in a biblical sense, you need to have telecommunications. So we might have a telecom in there. You need to have electricity. So we'll have utilities in there. So it's not strictly a consumer products portfolio, but we do go, you know, maybe you want to have a – you know, a company that makes aeroplanes in there because people have to travel to and from. So we look for companies, again, that have a history of paying increasing dividends, and there the objective is dividend growth. And we've, it's been just – it's just a beautiful thing to see. And, you know, a lot of the thinking behind that particular portfolio comes from, you know, one of my favorite people to follow who needed to say Warren Buffett. And, you know, you want to own companies that have a sustainable moat around them. Ask yourself the question, do you think this company will still be dominant in what it does in 50 years from today? And if you can answer yes to that question, then you don't need to worry about the next year, the next five, the next 10. You've already addressed the question of the next 50. Unlike certain companies, you can ask yourself the question, where do you think this company will be in 50 years? And you go, oh, I don't know, or I doubt it will be this dominant. Then at what point do you need to start being concerned about that? Is it you know, a- I, I just read two books uh, on uh, the way to invest is to buy 
companies who are increasing their dividends. Oh, I love well, it. One, one, one book title, I think, was uh, The World's Best Investment, and then the other was something like that. And they go through and they show that if a company is increasing dividends, we're not talking about the gross dividends, okay? We're talking about the rate of increase of dividends, that those are the companies that outperform in capital value over the following years. That is correct. I mean, you know, there's plenty of research out there to show that a lot of the returns that people get comes from the dividend. And especially the dividend growth. I mean, it's again rule of 72. You know, I'm yeah. a very basic kind of guy. I need basic concepts. People think I'm a rocket scientist. I oh boy, no, don't count on me to get that rocket to the moon. It ain't happening. <laughs> so the CLIP, uh, CLIP strategy focuses on those companies. And this is a long only fund with a couple dozen uh, positions in it. That uh, is correct. Depending on the portfolio size, there could be maybe up to 23, 24 positions. And then from time to time, opportunistically, we may take a tiny portion of the account and do a trade on an option. It, it, that, I want to emphasize that is not something that happens very regularly, but it could happen. We have that, we have that flexibility. If it, if it is successful, then we would take that additional capital appreciation and buy more of those dividend-paying stocks. So, again, we're just looking to enhance the distributable income is the term I like to use, which is the dividend flow from that portfolio. Okay, but I presume that there is no hedge on that There is no hedge on that portfolio. The hedge is somewhat, the the hedging in that portfolio, our our feeling is, and again, it's just our feeling, is based on the fact that you're owning these companies that have the dividends, and and those companies tend to not get hammered as hard as some other companies do when things go ugly. It's inherent in the quality of the uh, of the positions that you have. In Correct. The, Again, that's not to say that you couldn't have a, you know, a, a risk to an individual company. That certainly yeah. is there, but... Again, we own 23 to 24 companies, and it could be more, it could be less. Yeah. Um, I don't want to commit to, to a hard number sure. on that. But th- there, is, there is obviously that risk to an individual uh-huh. security. But again, it's not going to be detrimental to the portfolio, but it could certainly be impactful. Okay. But, uh, again, the intent, we haven't had any of that happen yet, but again, the intent is to is to go for that growing dividend income. Okay. And briefly, the, the third strategy. Yeah, so the third strategy, very interesting one. It's an inverse volatility strategy. And there, instead of buying call options on the S&P 500, we'll buy or trade in instruments that are linked to the inverse of volatility. And there's a number of instruments we can use for doing that. But again, the, the basic philosophy there is we still keep 90% of that portfolio in bonds, except the 10% threshold is not a one-year timeline it might be closer to a one month kind of threshold so it's not designed for the for, this is not designed for the faint at heart it's, this is i mean this thing moves um we yeah, have if a, you're trading the vix well, well, you know not directly the vix but but derivatives of it uh you're a brave man thank you yeah <laughs> you know i have a little cup at the office that says you know you can't scare me i trade options uh, so but again, what, what we love about using the options to get the risk exposure, I can look at the portfolio at any moment in time and see how much more risk do I have. And I can very quickly determine that I don't want to have that much risk or I'm perfectly comfortable with that much risk. And if I'm not comfortable with it, I'm changing my, my positions then and there. You know, I'm not going to say, oh, well, let's give it another week or two. That's, you know, that's like a year in the lifespan of a... Of, of an option. So, so is this designed to be a portfolio hedge or is it designed to be a, a strategy to uh, enhance performance? I, it's definitely a, it's to enhance performance. Okay. It's definitely, I would not use it to hedge a portfolio. No, it's not for that at all. It's okay. definitely to enhance performance. Okay. So we, we appreciate you sharing those with us. A couple of uh, change the subject just a little bit here. What's the best advice that you've ever heard, read, or um, been told about investing? Well, the first – it's probably Nike gave it, which is just do it, meaning you know, I, I see procrastination I think is the enemy of investing. People kind of hum and ha. Just do it. And now, maybe you'll be wrong, and it's okay to be wrong. But you might be wrong in the short term, but you'll be right in the long term. And I think people who kind of delay, delay, delay are doing themselves a huge disservice. Time is your best friend. Use it. That's – and you know, obviously, you know, Warren Buffett's rule of – you know, don't lose money, the golden rule, you know, rule number one, don't lose money, you know, rule number two, see rule one. I think it does need a little bit of a caveat on there, which is be prepared to take the losses you prepare to take or just the drawdowns is the term I prefer to use because a loss is only recognized when you sell. Markets will perform poorly from time to time. Don't let that scare you out of making investments because over the long term, we're going to be just fine. 
Yeah, you must work with a lot of educators and engineers because those are the ones. <laughs> Indecision is a killer. One. Oh, it's terrible because you know it's just I'm I'm not going to be right probably most of the time, but I'll be right over time, yeah. and that's what really matters. Okay. So, uh, a question we'd like to ask all of our guests: What keeps you awake at night, Bernard? Oh, I love that question because it's it's not the things that used to keep me awake at night. <laughs> um, you know, when back in the day when I started, and I've got you know over twenty four years in the industry now, it was you know modern portfolio theory you know was was you know introduced to us and. I always wonder when last was something referred to as modern that you know that Harry Moskowitz won a prize for I think in 1968 I think is when he uh, well he came out with the original uh, article 1952 yeah I believe 52 yeah. and I was uh, just talking yesterday about that with somebody yeah okay so what do you have from 1952 that you still refer to as modern a uh, Studebaker <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean you know I just bought myself a new car it's a 1972 <laughs> you know whatever so. I, I really marvel at that, that people still swear so solemnly by the modern portfolio theory. And, you know, I too was a, you know, was a believer for a while there until 2000 came along. And uh, you saw how all the asset classes converged into, in, in one direction, downward. Of course, you know, the two years of down in a row doesn't really happen very often. And needless to say, we got our second year. And the third year was the real doozy. Um, but we'd never had a three down in a row before, but there it was. And modern portfolio theory didn't, it just collapsed, and I, I've had the pleasure of actually meeting Harry one on one, and even he marvels at what's happened with his theory. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So I think that the modern portfolio theory thesis—I'm not saying it's necessarily terrible. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, but what I am saying is, I think we need to evolve from there. We need to rethink how we want to deal with risk going forward. And if you're not prepared to have drawdowns, then build a portfolio that you can go to sleep at night with. And so that's what we ended up doing. My partner Larry and I. We were looking for strategies similar to what we were doing, and we couldn't find it, so we built it. And one thing that doesn't keep me up at night is if the markets have, have a big drawdown. I know what I'm going to lose in my portfolio. I don't want to say to the penny, but I can certainly I, – I just discount the worst-case scenario. Now I know if the markets drop 100 – you know, if the markets drop 50% tomorrow, I know what's going to be left standing. And I'm at peace with that sitting here with you right now. You know, yesterday's 799-point drawdown – it happened. Uh, you know, I, 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 didn't, I slept very well last night. I slept very, very well the night before. So the things that keep me up at night are more related to kind of personal relationship stuff or health stuff. It's not related to market stuff, which, you know, it used to be back in the day that was, I'd be much more sensitive to, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen in the markets tomorrow morning? And it, it's, it's, that's not what keeps me up at night. Well, you're a fortunate man, I tell you. A second question we'd like to ask our guests, what book on investing would you recommend for a listener? So there's a couple I would like. I mean, I mean obviously, there's, this, there's The Snowball, which is about Warren Buffett's biography. Um, a great read for anybody who's looking for a good, you know, solid read. If you're looking for just literally a quick overnight read, there's The Richest Man in Babylon, which is a very <laughs> thin book. As I recall, I think it's only about 90 pages long. And it's just it's, – it tells in parables – wonderful ways to just understand very simple concepts you know have people you know engage people in the services who are experts in what they do don't go trust the fisherman to buy you the gold you know when he makes his trip to greece uh, he might come back with not real gold go deal with the, you know with the gold dealer so it's a it's a wonderful book easy read um didn't take me very long to read it so i, I would highly recommend that just as a very straightforward read and then, you know, there's a couple of books that, you know, that address more of our strategy, which have been written by uh, you know, the guy Svi Brody, who's written a couple of books. He's a professor out on the East Coast. Um, so th there's a number of books out there, but definitely, you know, the, the Snowball about Warren Buffett, highly recommend. And I would definitely recommend people read The Richest Man in Babylon. Bernard, thank you. So uh, for those who would like to know more, where can they go? Well, they can come to our, our website, you know, measuredriskportfolios.com. They can contact me directly. I'm at, you know, Bernard at mrpfolios.com. Come in, you know, feel free to reach out to us. You know, our phone number eight five eight nine three five one one two five. We're you know we're looking forward to doing more business with more people. We're here to answer questions. We like to help people sleep better at night. If I'm if, if the clients are sleeping well at night, we're sleeping well at night. So you know if clients aren't sleeping well at night, we're not sleeping well at night. It's just that simple. And you know thankfully our clients are sleeping well at night. Good. So final words for our listeners here, Bernard. Final words is, you know, as Nike says, just do it. Um, now, what it might be, just, you know, procrastination doesn't help anybody to get anything achieved. So that was, would be my final parting words. Just do it. Bernard, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And congratulations for creating some truly unique strategies here. And uh, best of luck in uh, 
best wishes for their continued success and yours as well. Here, Charlie, thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, I wish you all the best as well. Thank you. So, listeners, we again, we've been talking with Bernard Sorofsky, founder and chief investment officer of Measured Risk Portfolios out of San Diego, working primarily with investment advisors on unique investment strategies. You've been listening to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us at info at strategicinvestorradio.com and go to our website to hear podcasts of all of our interviews and shows, strategicinvestorradio.com. I'm Charlie Wright, wishing you an enjoyable week and productive investing. Strategic Investor Radio is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. Content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Charlie Wright, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing.